I enjoy scaring people a lot. I enjoy suspense <clears throat> and action and thrills. I enjoy comedy. I guess mainly the, the genres of films. Uh, I'm big on form and structure and within a certain context doing certain things. The film I'm making now, Halloween, uh, hopefully will be a, is a horror film loaded with scares. Suspense scares. Not, hopefully not grisly or, or gory, but but suspenseful, making people on the edge of their seats. It was the 25th of October, 1978. There had never been a movie called Halloween before John Carpenter delivered his quintessential horror classic. In fact, there had never been a movie with Halloween in the title. On a budget of just over $300,000, the calendar-based thriller would go on to earn $70 million worldwide making it the most successful independent film of all time, an achievement that would stand for 21 years until the release of The Blair Witch Project. I'm so sorry. <laughs> of course, there were films before Halloween which featured a crazed killer on the loose, most notably Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which helped pioneer the image of a masked ghoul off in the supporting cast. There was also a little movie called Psycho in 1960, a milestone which hung over Halloween like a spectre. This is the story of how a little exploitation film changed the course of a genre, and how a gifted director on his second feature would become one of the most acclaimed artists of his generation. This is the story of The Shape. John Howard Carpenter was born January 16th, 1948. His father, Howard Ralph Carpenter, was a music professor, a vocation which clearly left an impression on his son. Carpenter's early years were spent in the tranquil environs of Bowling Green, Kentucky, placid suburbia not unlike the one he would later exploit. There was nothing happening in Bowling Green, and there was nothing going to happen there. I was going to either become a teacher like my dad, my dad was a music teacher, I suppose I, I would have followed along in English or something like that. The only thing I really had that I loved was this rock and roll band I played in. My mom was a big movie fanatic and took me to everything. And uh, the little town I grew up in, there were two downtown theaters and there were two drive-ins. And I just went all the time. That's where I fell in love with cinema. John's passion for cinema was established early, and his preferred genres were westerns and horror films. He especially loved the work of Howard Hawks and John Ford, and 1951's The Thing from Another World left such an impression on the young carpenter that he would eventually remake it. This passion would lead him onto a course at USC Cinema School in California. Aside from giving him hands-on experience in all aspects of filmmaking, USC also provided lectures from such titans as Orson Welles, John Ford, and Alfred Hitchcock. I applied to USC and UCLA. My dad was kind enough to give me money, and off I went. 1968. Roman Polanski came down with his film, uh, Rosemary's Baby. We had uh, Antonioni. We did, it was unbelievable time to listen to these guys talk about movie making and then watch their films. I, I can't tell you what that was like. In 1969, the year of the Manson family murders, Carpenter would direct his first short film, The Eight Minute Captain Voyeur. The short, which was rediscovered in the USC vault in 2011, 
would bear striking similarities to his later work. It followed a bored office drone who takes a fancy to one of his female co-workers and stalks her home. The man then dons a mask and intends to kill her, only to be shot by his resourceful target. It didn't take long for Carpenter to get more ambitious. He would direct, produce, co-write and score the cult classic Dark Star with future Alien writer Dan O'Bannon. Having started out as just another USC project between 1970 and 1972, the sci-fi comedy would later be expanded into a full-length film. The $60,000 oddity was crude but effective, with critics of the time noting Carpenter's skill with modest resources. It wasn't long before Hollywood showed an interest. Get back in there. Come on. Come on. Come on. Carpenter got to make what he considers his first true feature in 1976, when he was approached by producer J. Stein Kaplan to make a low-budget exploitation film. Carpenter's only demand was that he receive complete creative control. A white-hot night of hate. Assault on Precinct 13. The film, originally titled The Anderson Alamo, would take its cues from Howard Hawks' Rio Bravo and focused on a police precinct being besieged by a ruthless street gang. This is a siege. It's a goddamn siege! Made for $100,000, Carpenter's debut would showcase everything he would later master with Halloween and beyond. A keen focus on suspense, macho anti-heroes, fiercely independent women, a synthesised soundtrack, and hard-hitting violence. Assault pushed the limits of its Panavision framing to breaking point. We're always waiting for a murderous gang member to leap out of the shadows. When it premiered at the 1977 London Film Festival, Assault received an overwhelmingly enthusiastic response. To this day, Carpenter credits his British distributor for giving him a career. That distributor's name was Michael Myers. Nineteen seventy eight was a significant year for the rising director. Halloween would make him a household name, but nestled between his masterpiece and a three hour television movie about Elvis, Carpenter filmed Someone's Watching Me for the NBC network. Often called his forgotten film, the high rise set thriller could almost be considered a dry run for Halloween, and interestingly, even has remnants of his old USC short. Shot in under 10 days, almost entirely on sound stages, the telefilm is a fascinating peek at Carpenter's growing technical prowess, as well as his ongoing thematic concerns. Someone's watching me, I learned some real basic director things about how to take care of myself during a shoot, how to pace myself, how to get accomplished the work for the day. Real kind of bread and butter problems that need to be solved if I was going to be a director that brought a film in on budget and on time. A lot of the style and the flow of Halloween can be directly related to someone's watching me. And I know that sounds odd, but a lot of the framing of the shots and a lot of the movements, and we did use a Panaglide a little bit or steady cam on someone's watching me. Playing like a 70s rear window, the story follows Lee Michaels, played by Lauren Hutton, who has recently moved to Los Angeles to begin a career in television. Unknowingly, she is being watched by a voyeur through a telescope. But this pervert isn't just any peeping Tom, even bugging her apartment. But when the police dismiss her increasing paranoia, Michaels is forced to take the situation into her own hands. Despite the tight budget and an even tighter shooting schedule, Someone's Watching Me has all the hallmarks you would expect of a Carpenter production. Aside from Adrian Barbo and Charles Cyphers filling out the supporting cast, it has beautifully lit photography, effortless tracking shots, homages to Hitchcock, 
and even an emphasis on old-fashioned and bloodless suspense. It all leads to a frantic conclusion in which the director gets to toy with that familiar image of a stranger leaping out of the shadows. If someone's watching me, the victim wouldn't be saved by a hail of police bullets. She would save herself. You got too close. Halloween commenced production in the spring of 1978, a mere two weeks after its director had wrapped up Someone's Watching Me for NBC. On a bargain basement price of $300,000, Halloween was shot in a mere 20 days. Just 30 years old, the hungry director had no idea that his little bee picture was about to change the course of his life and influence countless others. My job uh, in making Halloween was to do an exploitation horror film. Then the basic premise was given to me by my distributor, Erwin U. Blondes, he said, uh, let's do a movie about these babysitters who get stalked by a killer. It was Yablan's suggestion to set the film on All Hallows' Eve, a stroke of genius that would give the film an unforeseen power. Never been used as a title before, never been used at all. It was an underutilized uh, holiday, so great. And I was a young director then, I was hungry for experience, hungry for features. I had done uh, some work before then. I said, sure, why not? Well, when we were making the film, I thought, uh, gee, it's Halloween at night and people get dressed up in masks. What better way to have a killer not be identified than be wearing a mask? Amazingly, the script for Halloween came together in just over a week. Acting as Carpenter's co-writer and producer was then-girlfriend Deborah Hill, who had been the script supervisor for Assault on Precinct 13. Hill would focus on the film's all-important babysitters, being ideally suited to pen the teenage girl's dialogue. Carpenter would focus on everything involving their masked murderer, Michael Myers, labelled in the script as The Shape.
The nickname is supposedly a reference to the judges of the Salem witch trials, who referred to spirits and demons as shapes. It's an ideal term for the film's blank emotionless killer, who may or may not be a non-corporeal entity. In 1963, at the age of six, Michael Aubrey Myers kills his sister Judith on Halloween night, and for the next 15 years, he is hospitalised in a sanitarium. The boy is a catatonic. He exhibits comatose behaviour. No reaction to external stimuli. I can see no reason why he shouldn't remain here. We have adequate facilities for his care. In 1978, he escapes, setting his sight in his hometown for a Halloween to remember. Come on now. Tasked with playing the vicious murderer would be Carpenter's old USC cohort, Nick Castle, who was paid the princely sum of $25 a day for his efforts. Castle received very little direction from his friend, who once told him that his motivation was to walk from one set marker to another. A rare exception is when Michael, having just stabbed an unlucky teenager to death, tilts his head from side to side as if admiring his grisly handiwork. The scene is a good example of how the director would resist graphic on-screen gore in favour of carefully lit compositions. There's an old-fashioned idea, I guess it goes back to Val Luton, that if you're going to make a movie about a monster, you never want to really see it. You want to keep it in the dark, because it's more effective that way. Carpenter often places him on the periphery of the frame, rarely going for a close-up, and wisely keeping him bathed in shadow. Decked out in overalls taken from an unlucky mechanic, Michael finishes off his ensemble with a stolen fright mask. In reality, a Star Trek Captain Kirk mask bought for less than $2. Production designer and editor Tommy Lee Wallace was responsible for the chilling visage. He painted it chalk white, teased out the hair, and widened the eye holes. Wallace would also don the costume for a few key moments, as with Deborah Hill and stuntman Jim Winburn. In addition, a young Tony Moran would play an unmasked Myers in the closing scene. A total of six people were responsible for bringing Michael to life. Halloween introduces us to the fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois, named after Hill's birthplace of Haddonfield, New Jersey. Though supposedly shot in the Midwest, Carpenter and his crew shot the film in South Pasadena, California. Much of the cast wore their own clothes, the crew struggled to find pumpkins in the spring, and the autumn leaves blowing through the town were reused over and over again. I, I hate to pontificate, the more difficult genres to pull off are comedies and horror films, because they require its timing. Dramas are the easiest. You usually have people talking to each other, and you can just shoot close-ups. Yeah. And horror, in cr creating a mood in horror films, or creating the right mood in a comedy, is, is hard. It's hard to do, you need a feeling for it. Charged with creating the film's startling visuals was cinematographer Dean Cundy, who would go on to shoot such classics as Back to the Future and Jurassic Park. Half of the film's tiny budget went entirely on the Panavision cameras and processing, ensuring that the homemade effort could look like a million dollars. Cundy's highly atmospheric lighting, which was partially inspired by Roman Polanski's Chinatown, would result in some of the film's most iconic moments. Halloween also made extensive use of the Panaglide, Later the Steadicam, the apparatus made it possible for Carpenter to enjoy gliding dreamlike shots, and also to put the audience in the killer's POV. He wasn't the first to do this. Bob Clark had done it four years earlier in his prototypical slasher film Black Christmas, but Halloween would master the technique. Carpenter made the film on time and on budget. 
No one could have predicted that the boy from Bowling Green, who dreamed of making westerns, was about to become synonymous with the horror genre. And he wasn't the only one. Future Scream Queen Jamie Lee Curtis was a nobody when Halloween made her a star in 1978. She wasn't even Carpenter's original choice for the lead, as the director had favoured Annie Lockhart, the daughter of Lassie actress June Lockhart. Curtis, however, had a much more marketable lineage. Her parents were Hollywood stars Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. Eighteen years earlier, Lee had cemented her cinematic legacy by dying in a Bates Motel shower for Alfred Hitchcock. Now, being such a Hitchcock fan, did the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis was Janet Lee's daughter have anything at all to do with the casting? Deborah brought that up, thought that would be a great idea. Yeah. Isn't this cool? Yeah, it was okay. <laughs> she read for the part. She was absolutely fabulous. She was 18 years old? Yeah, 18 or 19, something like that. Maybe even younger, I'm not sure. Immediately prior to Halloween, Curtis had appeared in such television series as Operation Petticoat, Quincy and Columbo. I can come back. No, 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 no. I'll have, um... I'll have a donut. As bookish teenager Laurie Strode, Curtis immediately gains the audience's affections. We learn just enough about Laurie to feel like we know her. She's intelligent, has low self-esteem, and is not so secretly crushing on an unseen boy named Bennett Tramer. Tommy, Halloween night, it's when people play tricks on each other. It's all make-believe. I think Richie was just trying to scare you. I saw the boogeyman. I saw him outside. There was nobody outside. There was. What do you look like? The boogeyman. We're not getting anywhere. All right. The boogeyman can only come out on Halloween night, right? Right. While well, I'm here tonight, I'm not about to let anything happen to you. Promise? promise. There were no trailers. There was one Winnebago for every department. So makeup, hair, wardrobe, all in one little tiny mobile home. Um, you know, the caterer was a friend of John and Deborah's and, and they came and made lunch for us. That was the experience. I was my first movie and obviously that was the really lovely part of it was this very warm family feeling. Strode would become the blueprint for what is known to genre fans as the final girl. After Halloween, these good-natured and resourceful heroines would best the killer due to their virginal purity, whilst their friends would die one by one by succumbing to drugs or promiscuous sex. Carpenter maintains that he never intended to make a moral judgement, only depicting teenagers as he and Deborah Hill saw them. Nevertheless, the so-called rules established by Halloween would be recycled over and over again. Laurie ultimately lives to see another day because she is acutely aware of her surroundings. There's very little in her life to distract her. Even her parents are nowhere to be seen, save for a brief conversation with her father earlier in the film, a character we never see again for the entirety of the series. 
The argument could be made that Miss Strode didn't survive because she's a virgin, but because she's the only one to notice the shape's presence. Note the infamous hedge sequence, in which Carpenter makes it visually clear that Laurie is more tuned in than her friends. As you watch Halloween, your basic sympathies are always enlisted on the side of the woman, not with the killer. The movie develops its women characters as independent, intelligent, spunky and interesting people. Halloween does not hate women. Famed film critic Roger Ebert, who would be instrumental in Halloween's success, dubbed imitators as the dead teenager genre. More often than not, the supporting characters would exist merely to die horribly. It didn't matter if a victim was memorable or even sympathetic, just so long as Tom Savini could throw an axe into their face. Halloween never falls into this trap, and makes Laurie's friends just as empathetic as Curtis herself, for the most part. So what is this big, big news? What would you say if I told you that you were going to the homecoming dance tomorrow night? I'd probably say you had the wrong number. <laughs> well, I just talked with Ben Tramer and he got real excited when I told him how attracted you were to him. Oh, Annie. Oh, you didn't. Please tell me you didn't. How could you do that? I mean, how could you just call me? <laughs> Carpenter regular Nancy Kayetz, billed as Nancy Loomis, would play the doomed Annie Brackett, daughter of Haddonfield's Sheriff Brackett, played by Charles Cyphers. Both had appeared in Assault on Precinct 13, and like before, Loomis plays the most bratty, though sympathetic, character. Hi, Annie. Sorry. Hi, Dad. What happened? What? What happened? Oh, uh, somebody broke into the hardware store. Probably kids. You blame everything on kids. Well, now, all they took was some Halloween mask, a uh, rope, and a couple of knives. Who do you think it was? It's hard growing up with a cynical father. After Halloween, she would appear in Carpenter's The Fog and the unrelated Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, directed by her then-husband, Tommy Lee Wallace. As the totally carefree Linda Vanderklok, PJ Souls is another revelation. She was already known to genre fans for appearing in Brian De Palma's Carrie two years earlier, and would later appear in such notable films as Rock and Roll High School, Private Benjamin, Stripes, and The Devil's Rejects. You know, it's totally insane. We have three new cheers to learn in the morning. The game is in the afternoon. I have to get my hair done at five, and the dance is at eight. I'll be totally wiped out. I don't think you have enough to do tomorrow. Totally. Originally, the part of her murdered boyfriend, Bob Sims, was to be played by Soul's then-boyfriend, Dennis Quaid, but schedule conflicts resulted in John Michael Graham playing the part. Go get me a beer. I thought you were going to get me one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. In the final act, when Laurie discovers the remains of her friends, she fulfills the final girl's purpose of fighting back against the bogeyman. (laughs) 
though some would later label the film as misogynistic. Halloween concludes with its heroine attacking her attacker with a parade of phallic objects. The shape, stabbed and bleeding on the floor, is supposedly vanquished. But when is it ever that easy? Survival has its own price, however, and Curtis would be haunted by Michael Myers for many years to come. Though legitimate jobs were scarce immediately following Halloween, she would soon blossom in the genre which made her a star. Between 1978 and 1981, she would make Halloween 2, Carpenter's The Fog, which also featured Janet Lee, and the slasher knockoffs Prom Night and Terror Train. Curtis did manage to shed her Scream Queen image and become a respected performer in studio films going on to the likes of Trading Places, A Fish Called Wonder, and True Lies. And yet she has never shied away from her exploitation roots and her proud fate as the final girl. I wear my Halloween pin with great pride. You know, I, I tried very hard through 22 now years of making movies to always hold up Halloween and say, you know, A, it was the best experience I ever had. It was by far up until uh, true lies, the best part I ever had. You know, I, I tried to point out the irony that in those exploitation movies, I was intelligent, uh, forthright, fought back against adversity, um, and was the lead in those movies for that role. Man. As a matter of fact, it was. Anything like this before? Only minimum security. I see. The driveway is a few hundred yards up on the right. The only thing that ever bothers me is their gibberish. When they start raving on and on. You haven't anything to worry about. He hasn't spoken a word in 15 years. Many might be surprised to learn that the late Donald Pleasance wasn't the first choice for Myers' psychiatrist, Dr. Sam Loomis, named after the character John Gavin played in Psycho. Oh, Sam, let's get married. Yeah. Live with me in a storeroom behind a hardware store in Fairvale. We'll have lots of laughs. Donald Pleasance was there for. Oh, I was he there for four or five days, you know. You originally wanted Christopher Lee for I that tried part. Christopher Lee, I tried Peter Cushing. Oh. Just uh, because of the old Hammer films. They wouldn't hear of it. Really? They wouldn't hear of it. Ladies and gentlemen, the sinister but lovable Donald Pleasance. <laughs> It was only when Erwin Yablan suggested Pleasance that the film bagged a name actor, and as a result, some credibility. Sheriff. Pardon me, I'm uh, Loomis, Dr. Sam Loomis. I'd be bracket. I I'd like to have a word with you if I could. Well, maybe a few minutes. It's, I've got to take just care. important. Before Halloween, Americans probably knew him best as the most iconic of the Blofelds in the James Bond blockbuster, Who Only Lived Twice. But by 1978, Pleasance was already a respected thesp, with many notable credits to his name. Thank you for getting me out. He had developed a reputation as a man with versatility, running the gamut from everyman to wide-eyed Australian rogues. You don't think the Yabba is the greatest little place on earth? Could be worse. How? Supply of beer could run out. 
was also, by all accounts, a deeply kind and selfless man, who, in 1940, put aside his status as a conscientious objector to join the war effort with the Royal Air Force. After being shot down in 1944, he would spend some time in a German prisoner of war camp, where it is said he escaped the horror of his situation by producing and acting in plays. Uh, I was shot down, jumped out, <laughs> jumped out of the airplane. Uh, I didn't expect to land safely, but I did, so I unbuckled my, my parachute and prepared to do all the things that I was supposed to do in order to escape when I saw about 50 Germans uh, advancing upon me with, with uh, everything from uh, machine guns to axes. Perhaps it's this up-close and personal confrontation with evil that underscores the Loomis character and why Pleasant's delivery is so convincing, despite Carpenter's florid writing. Does anybody live here? Well, not since 1963 when it happened. Every kid in Haddonfield thinks this place is haunted. Then maybe the right. Loomis's function in the plot is to fill us in on the bogeyman, who, by design, needs a Van Helsing to his Dracula. Though supposedly the hero, Loomis is often shown to be a nervous, easily agitated doctor whose ramblings of true evil paint him as an oddball to anyone polite enough to listen to him. I'm wasting my time. Sam Haddonfield is 150 miles away from here now. Now, for God's sakes, he can't drive a car. He was doing very well last night. Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. This is also a man who, at one point, scares children and then smiles about it. Hey! Hey, Nani, get your ass away from there. Loomis is so concerned about stopping Michael that he's practically become a loony himself. The Doctor's Crusade is summed up best in the film's most famous monologue, delivered to Charles Cypher's Sheriff Brackett, whose daughter would later be killed by Myers. Not only is the passage anchored by Pleasant's note-perfect performance, but it was also inspired by Carpenter's encounter with a Kentucky mental patient. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face, and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. What do we do? He's been here once tonight. I think he'll come back. I'm going to wait for him. I still think I should notify the radio and television. No. If you do that, they'll see him on every street corner. They'll look for him in every house. Just tell your men to keep their mouths shut and their eyes open. It is in the final scene, however, where the gifted actor makes his most valuable contribution. When we were shooting the sequence coming up, Donald Pleasance asked me, how do you want me to react when I look off the balcony. There are two ways. I can react, oh my God, he's gone. Or I can react, I knew he would be gone. It was the first time an actor had ever given me a choice and I was stunned by it. So I asked Donald to please play it both ways and let me decide later. See if you can figure out which choice I made as he looks down from the porch. Halloween would give Pleasance newfound fame, and he would return as Dr. Sam Loomis in four of the eight sequels. 1995's Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers was released mere months after his death and dedicated to his memory. Donald Pleasance was a very private man and rarely did interviews or discussed his work, 
that in 2018 his standing as a performer is as strong as it ever was. Carpenter agreed, later casting him in Escape from New York and Prince of Darkness. For 15 years I've been obsessed to find out what was going on inside of him. It's been my life work and my ultimate failure. This force, this thing that lived inside of him came from a source too violent, too deadly for you to imagine it. It grew inside him, contaminating his soul. It was pure evil. Donald was a, an actor that I truly loved and really wanted to work with. Um, I, I admired his work throughout his career. And uh, he, I was a little scared of him. Uh, but we became fast friends on Halloween and, and we made other films together. He became a dear, dear friend of mine. And uh, he was a wonderful human being. He, I don't think he ever got the recognition that is due him uh, from, uh, I don't know, the world at large. Perhaps he did. I never felt it. He was rated as that good an actor, but he was a fabulous actor and a close friend. I miss him very much. I still miss him. Halloween achieves a lot over its 91 minutes, but it is the first five which cement it as a genre classic. Allowing the audience to adopt a young Michael Myers' point of view, the prologue not only pushed the capabilities of the Panaglide to its limits, but it made viewers feel like unwitting voyeurs in the slaughter. This one long tracking shot was inspired by, of course, the tracking shot we all remember from Touch of Evil, the Orson Welles film. As I look at the movie, the primary influence on the style of the film was the work of Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock's moving camera would bring you, without a cut, from one environment to another, one room to another, one set to another. Shot over the final two days of principal photography, the sequence appears to be a single, unbroken shot, instantly announcing Halloween's intentions to make honest, artful cinema. The scene of the crime is the Myers residence, a spin on the old haunted house which Hitchcock had already transposed to a modern day setting for Norman Bates. And as we're tracking around this direction, the crew is inside flipping all the lights around in anticipation of us coming around back of the house and coming in the other way. There's an incredible noise going on inside. Up the steps, now we're lit. There's a whole little caravan following this camera. And one of the members of the caravan is Deborah Hill dressed in a clown outfit. And in a minute, you're going to see her hand. property, loaned to the filmmakers by a local church, was depicted in its decrepit, run-down state for the majority of the filming, only to be given a thorough spit and polish by the cast and crew for its 1963 counterpart. This is a very narrow house, and it had just been painted a few hours earlier, and the parts that we see were the only parts that were painted. Now you're going to see a human struggle with a camera and a very small staircase. We're trying to hold the light up on the left in frame because the foreground is going out of focus. Now up we come, jiggling and bouncing. Now the operator's almost made it. He's saved his own life. He's at the top of the stairs. He sees a mask. As this mask is put on the camera, there's Deborah's hand again. We're gonna make a cut. Now we're into another shot and another take. 
Given the opening's point of view, the slaying of a naked Judith Myers is easily the most graphic murder in the entire film, and even this is partially concealed by an optical effect to create the holes in Michael's mask. The same effect would later be updated to make the holes smaller when Halloween made its television debut in 1981. The director seems to be well aware of the scene's tawdriness. During Michael's flurry of knife swings, the camera pans up to focus on the blade as it strikes, sparing us from every last agonising detail. The final gut punch is the reveal that this murder has been committed by a six-year-old boy, a reversal in perspective which never seems to lose its unsettling power. Michael? One of my favorite shots in the history of cinema is the long tracking shot at the beginning of the first Halloween. Yeah. I was always wondering how many takes it, it took to do that shot, but also how did you get the eyes with the, with the mask over it? How did you pull that off? Ooh. Well, it was five takes, and uh, the, the eyes in, in the uh, mask were do is done by MGM Optical Department. That's you know, there's a cut in there, too. Where it's not cut? all one take, but I can't tell you. <laughs> Do you know where this cut is? No, I have no idea. Yeah, there's a cut in there. <laughs> You'll never see it. We this hit it, we buried it, big time. It has often been said that a good score is paramount to a horror film's success, and Carpenter's soundtrack for Halloween remains one of the most lauded and instantly recognisable in slasher cinema. I was fast and cheap. I was the only one. You, you, when a low-budget movie, you never can afford music, especially in the level I was working. So I would, could provide a carpet of music to uh, enhance the image. I mean, that was it. Carpenter bills himself as the Bowling Green Orchestra in the end credits, and this is fitting, as the inspiration for Halloween's title track goes all the way back to his father's passion for music. My father was a uh, music teacher, so he decided when I was about eight years old that I needed to start learning the violin. Unfortunately, I had no talent at it, Yeah. but I, I struggled and I finally quit. But I went on to keyboards and guitars and I had a local rock and roll band in oh, the yeah? little town I lived in. Where was this? Bowling Green, Kentucky. In Kentucky, uh, a rock band. Uh, what year are we talking, John? We're talking in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. My father was one of the founding members of the Nashville Strings. And what that is, is backup strings from for Roy Orbison and Brenda Lee and all the Nashville recording art. Really? So he played for everybody, including Johnny Cash. He played for everybody. So he's on all those records? Oh, yeah. On the Roy Orbison records? On the Roy Orbison records. Carpenter's inspirations come from a myriad of sources, from classical to hard rock. The latter would be most apparent in Precinct 13, which had its roots in Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song. He would also take his cues from the great Bernard Herrmann, Hitchcock's regular composer, and, naturally, the scorer of Psycho. Halloween's piano-based score was completed in three days and dominates the film, although there are two songs on the soundtrack, a piece by Carpenter's band The Coupe de Villes and Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper, which plays as an ironic counterpoint to Michael stalking Laurie and Annie. Though lacking a symphonic complexity, Carpenter's threadbare carpet laying is impossible to forget and fits the images like a glove. My uh, inspiration in terms of film scores was not so much of, of anyone who played electronic music, but was from classical compositions. Bernard Herrmann was a big influence on me. 
and mainly because he he created such effective scores by using so, such simple uh, instrumentation, sometimes just a few strings, as in Psycho, sometimes a big orchestra. But uh, his, his music was so powerful. So uh, I would go on a synthesizer and imitate uh, orchestral sounds, and always thinking of, uh, of Bernard Herrmann. The director himself would describe his work as transformative, giving the film most of its atmosphere and suspense. Its widespread success also ensured that he would continue to provide the music for his films. Out of the 15 features he directed after Halloween, Carpenter scored all but four of them. In 2015, at the age of 67, Carpenter would become a curmudgeonly rock star when he signed with Sacred Bones Records to release Lost Themes and Lost Themes 2, albums comprised of unused material from his many years in the industry. This was soon followed by an updated movie themes compilation and a series of sellout world tours. You can't help but feel that the music-loving Howard Carpenter would have been very proud of his son. Halloween premiered October 25th, 1978. It would soon expand across the country, eventually playing in 232 cinemas across the US. Handling distribution was Compass International Pictures, and they were just as ill-prepared for Halloween's success as the filmmakers. So Halloween was released and, and, and you know, everyone assumes that it really became this big, big success, which it became after a period of time, but it was not an immediate success. And I ended up, after Halloween, doing a Charlie's Angels episode, and I did a Love Boat episode with my mother. Initial reviews were decidedly horrible, resembling the critiques you might expect of a Halloween copycat. Two reviews, however, would change that. <laughs> so uniformly awful reviews. The movie's not scary. <laughs> Until it finally really uh, reached the East Coast. And the, there was a Village Voice review. And then that kind of turned things around. The second glowing recommendation came from Roger Ebert in the Chicago Sun-Times, who placed the film in his top ten of 1978. Ticket sales began to skyrocket and critics who had once dismissed it as schlocky trash were soon calling it masterful suspense. Word of mouth was just as strong, and audiences were quite literally screaming in the aisles. Halloween would slowly grow into an indie blockbuster, grossing 70 million worldwide on its minuscule budget. In 2018, that would be over 200 million. Carpenter, who received a mere $10,000 for writing, directing and scoring the film, had a 10% stake in the profits. Though he would later complain about not receiving his fair share of the gross, the struggling indie filmmaker was now a very rich man. Carpenter also had the foresight to ask for one fateful request, his name above the title. Though ballsy for a filmmaker with very few credits under his belt, the move effectively branded Halloween as his. For Carpenter, the success was a way to continue making movies, but for others, it was a new way to make a quick buck. Slasher rip-off soon monopolised the horror genre, and Universal Pictures and Dino De Laurentiis would come calling for more Michael Myers. 
The prospect of Halloween 2 became very real, despite the protests of Carpenter, Deborah Hill and Erwin Yablins. Although championing a sequel would be successful Syrian financer Mustafa Akat, who had bankrolled Halloween. It's a well-known fact that Akkad had little interest in the project, having ceded creative control to Carpenter, Hill and Yablans, but the truly unexpected box office meant that Akkad's professional life would be dominated by The Shape for the remainder of his career. Of the many sequels, 1981's Halloween 2 is generally considered the best by fans, but it had a particularly sour genesis. Carpenter had discussed making the fog with Yablan's involvement, but when he took the film to Avco Embassy, Yablan's would essentially sue him into getting Halloween 2 made. Knowing that a sequel would be produced with or without him, Carpenter would once again write the script with Hill. He described this process as especially difficult, as they all felt there was no story left to tell. Directing the film would be newcomer Rick Rosenthal, who insisted that if Halloween 2 was to work, it would have to pick up the second Halloween ended. To make the transition complete, they would bring back Dean Cundy to photograph the slaughter, as well as Curtis, Pleasance, Cyphers, and, in an unexpected cameo, Nancy Loomis. Carpenter would once again compose the score, this time in collaboration with Alan Howarth, who would later co-score several of the director's films. All of these elements make it a serviceable continuation, although the presence of graphic violence would push the series closer to the original's disreputable imitators. Carpenter, who was clearly starved for inspiration, hit upon the twist of making Laurie Strode Michael's sister. This would be perceived by some as a mistake, as it robs Myers of his randomness and now gives him an M.O. for his crimes. It also doesn't make much sense, as Laurie's real estate foster father told her to drop the keys off at the Myers house in the original film. Either he forgot her brother was a vicious murderer, or he has a sick sense of humour. That's Strode girl. That's Michael Myers' sister. She was born two years before he was committed. Two years after, his parents died and she was adopted by the Strodes. They requested that the records be sealed in order to protect the family. Jesus, don't you see what he's doing here in Haddonfield? He killed one sister 15 years ago, now he's trying to kill the other. Halloween 2 would also effectively end the Myers plotline. The film concludes with Michael finding Laurie at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, Dr Loomis in tow. His psychiatrist, knowing there is no other way to stop the madness, promptly blows himself and the shape to smithereens. It is time, Michael. The final image of the film is Michael's mask burning to a crisp. For all intents and purposes, the shape was dead. 1982's Halloween 3 Season of the Witch was a valiant attempt to steer the franchise away from Haddonfield and turn the series into an anthology. Written and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace, the story about Halloween masks being used to murder children featured neither hide nor hair of Michael Myers. Despite Cundy once again lending his talents, and the presence of Carpenter and Howarth on the soundtrack, it would be both a critical and commercial failure. In 1988, Akkad would use his power to resurrect the shape for Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, which naturally became a big, big success. It would be followed by Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, and Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. For many, the most noteworthy element of these films is the continuing crusade of Dr Sam Loomis, who miraculously survived the explosion with a mere burn mark on his cheek. Pleasance brought his all to the part, despite them diminishing returns. In 1998, having made the transition from slasher to mainstream fare, Curtis decided to get the gang back together for a 20th anniversary sequel, and a proposed ending to the saga. 
Her intent was to get Carpenter back in the director's chair with Hill producing, but when ACAD and Dimension Films bolts at the $10 million salary demands, the job was given to Steve Miner. The resultant film, Halloween H20, 20 years later, would become one of the best reviewed entries in the series. It's not so easy to kill the shape, however, and Akkad would bring him back for 2002's universally hated Halloween Resurrection. It would be his final entry in the series, as both he and Deborah Hill died in 2005. We would lose Hill to cancer, and Akkad to the Amman bombings in Jordan. We've all had bad things happen to us. The trick is to concentrate on today. What do I know? You just take care of yourself, okay? Thank you very much. I'll see you Monday. Oh, M Miss Tate. Uh, happy Halloween. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. Big no no! Big no! Big no! Big no! Sex equals death, okay? Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. No, the sin factor. It's a sin, it's an extension of number one. And number three, Never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, say, I'll be right back. Because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back! <laughs> the release of Halloween would see its director soar to new heights, but its influence on the horror genre was just as seismic. Filmmakers emulated its formula by cranking up cheap and cheerful copies almost immediately. The 1980s were a mad dash to capitalise on what would soon be known as the slasher film. Between 1980 and 1990, somewhere in the region of 150 slasher flicks were given wide releases. I think the reason that all these slasher movies came in the 80s was a lot of folks said, look at that Halloween movie. It, made, it was made for peanuts, and look at the money it's made. We can make money like that. That's what the teenagers want to see. So they just started making them, cranking them out. And uh, most of them were awful. Though there have been popular exceptions along the way, slashers would often take the wrong lessons from Carpenter's classic. They had the small budgets, stripped down locations, nubile teenagers and bloodthirsty killers. But they usually lacked the suspense class or plain good taste. The trend was solidified by 1980's Friday the 13th, an exploitation cheapie by Sean S. Cunningham, which had the dubious honour of being the first slasher movie to be bought and distributed by a Hollywood studio. It wasn't born out of creativity, but to produce a Halloween-like hit, crassly copying its structure to the letter. The blood and guts would soon become the most noteworthy element in a genre rapidly descending into sadism. Well, violence. Violence is an interesting topic. It's, all, it, it's always been in movies. Violence was in movies in the very beginning. Back in the 
a picture called The uh, Great Train Robbery, which is a silent film. In the end of the movie, this cowboy takes, takes his gun and points it right at the audience and shoots. And the audience of the time, oh, God, just upset them. Um, I'm not familiar with a movie called The Wild Bunch. It was an extremely violent movie. Um, it depends on the story you're telling. I think that you have to be careful that you're not advocating violence. By that, I mean you're not suggesting that violence is a way to solve problems. Um, violence should be the last possible. Um, it should be the last possible thing that you try in a bad situation. However, you get into a movie, and, and let's say like Halloween, you have a a killer who's out there, and you kind of have to deal with that area. I've made some violent movies, and um, it's fun. It's fun making violent films. It's a lot of fun to do it. I mean, actors seem to always want to die on the screen. They love it. Um, I think you have to be careful with audiences. Probably the most violent scene or the most disturbing scene I've ever done in a film was in a picture I made called Assault on Precinct 13. There's a little girl who gets shot with a silencer. And audiences were very, very upset at that. The horror film is kind of dying out as a popular genre because the action movie has stolen all of its techniques. If you look at a movie like uh, Die Hard 2, and the slitting of the throat and so forth, and knives going in, they're right out of horror films. As a matter of fact, the director is a horror movie director. So um, Terminator 2 is a, basically a horror film. All those techniques that we used to use in, in, in horror are now in the, in the big budget action film. The slasher film would soon die out, giving way to found footage and paranormal horror, but the shockwaves caused by Michael Myers are still being felt four decades later. Along with George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, Halloween can safely be called one of the most influential films in cinema history. But instead of questioning what Halloween gave to the horror genre, maybe we should be thankful for everything it gave John Carpenter. positive attitude about this. Good, me too. Yeah. The last 20 years have been pretty rough for The Shape. After the franchise died a death with 2002's Halloween Resurrection, there was seemingly nothing left to do but start from scratch. Dimension Films hired Rob Zombie to do the unthinkable, write and direct a remake of the original film. In a bid to make 2007's Halloween unique, Zombie, best known for The Devil's Rejects, would provide an exploration into Michael's childhood and his days at Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Many agreed that this destroyed the mystery of Myers, a character better left to the viewer's imagination. First of all, big fan, thank you for all your great films. Thank you. And my question is, how do you feel about the horror film remake trend in Hollywood that's going on right now? And also about your uh, Halloween movie that Rob Zombie remade. <laughs> Did you like it? Oh, God. God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, those are great questions. First of all, remakes in general are popular now because of the amount of money a company has to spend advertising to get people in the theaters. And one way to cut through the clutter of advertising that's out there is to come with a title in recent memory that they've heard of. So, for instance, all the horror remakes I, I thought that he took away the mystique of the, of the story by 
explaining too much about the guy. I don't care about that. It's supposed to be a force of nature. He's supposed to be almost supernatural. And knowing about that uh, was, and he was too big. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't normal. <laughs> anyway, come here. Anyway. Great. Zombies Relaunch was a box office smash despite highly negative reviews, leading to 2009's Halloween 2, which continued the blood splattered explanations of Michael's psychosis. With fans in revolt and revenues dwindling, you might have been correct to assume that the shape was finally toast. After a nine year hiatus, the longest gap in the franchise's history, a successful horror producer Jason Blum decided to resurrect Myers for a true sequel to the original. Director David Gordon Green would collaborate with co-writer Danny McBride to effectively swipe the slate clean, making a direct follow-up to the 1978 classic and wiping every other film out of continuity. This allowed the triumphant return of Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode. Having dealt with the trauma of losing her friends 40 years ago, the final girl has matured into a hardened, shotgun-wielding grandmother, all too ready for Michael's return. Her warnings of the bogeyman also make Curtis the Dr Loomis of this particular story, and, fatefully, she is now the same age Donald Pleasance was in the original. Even more unexpected was the return of John Carpenter, who would shepherd the project as an executive producer. Not only that, but he would once again compose the score, this time with his son Cody and Daniel Davies, the son of Dave Davies. 2018's Halloween appears to be quite the 40th anniversary present for fans. Original shape Nick Castle will briefly reprise his role in the cameo, and the trailers reveal a film replete with references to the franchise's storied history. Fans are excited that maybe, just maybe, this will be the sequel to end all sequels. Happy Halloween, Michael. Horror has been with cinema since the very beginning. It grew up part and parcel with the image, with cinema. And it will always be with us. It's one of the most popular genres of all time. And it, it's, a all, it's an all-purpose genre because it keeps changing. Every culture, every few years, it, it morphs, it changes into something else. It brings the sensibilities of the age in which it's made, which is, that's what's so fabulous. If you look at Frankenstein or Dracula or the Bride of Frankenstein, the, the Karloff films that were made at this studio, they're very much of the 30s and the Depression. They're depression era movies. They're speaking to those audiences. But if you look at modern horror films, they're speaking to you guys. But I've made a career out of it. I've got to become John Carpenter. What's wrong with that? Excuse me, Lori. Oh, Mr. Brackett, I'm sorry, Mr. Brackett. Oh, I didn't mean to startle you. I'm sorry. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? 